Welcome to The Vast Majority. I'm Jacobin Deputy Editor Micah Utrecht. We're all still wrestling with where the left should go after the end of the second Bernie Sanders campaign. And as devastated and forlorn as many of us still are at the end of that campaign, the reborn American socialist movement that came out of Bernie's two runs is not something that we should take for granted. And for those of us who understand that, that we can't just throw in the towel now, there are few better thinkers to wrestle with than Leo Panitch. Leo is a professor emeritus of politics at York University in Toronto, Canada. He's the co-editor of The Socialist Register and the author of many books, including most recently The Socialist Challenge Today, which he wrote with Sam Gindin and Stephen Marr, and Searching for Socialism, the project of the labor left from Ben to Corbin with Colin Lays. He also recently recorded a video for our stay-at-home YouTube series on the thought of Ralph Miliband. Leo was Ralph's student at the London School of Economics, and there is arguably no single thinker who has had a more substantial impact on us at Jacobin than Ralph Miliband, so do check out Leo's video talking about him. I'll link to the video in the show notes. As I just said, we have a YouTube series called Stay at Home, which uh, some of you are probably familiar with, but those who aren't, it is a YouTube political education series that we started at the beginning of coronavirus pandemic. And we are now almost 50 episodes in to a whole range of topics. We have somebody talk for about half an hour, give a lecture on a given topic, and then we open it up to discussion uh, and questions that come from our uh, YouTube audience. So if you haven't checked it out already, please go to YouTube and find the Jackman page. Subscribe to our channel and like the videos and check out the stay-at-home lectures we've already recorded and stay tuned for the ones that we are doing in the near future. We are recording multiple new episodes each week. Okay, here's my conversation with Leo Panich. Leo, thanks for coming on. Very happy to be here, Micah. So before we get into your book that you wrote with Sam Gindin and Stephen Marr, The Socialist Challenge today, I just want to ask uh, off the bat maybe the most important question at least for American socialists right now uh, what your uh, kind of cliff notes version is on uh, why the uh, Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign failed uh, it didn't fail uh, as someone once said when people my age say we failed to create a new democratic mass socialist party they don't say you they say you didn't fail you were defeated uh, and and I guess Sanders was defeated by uh, the large number of progressives, liberals, democratic socialists, even pragmatic socialists uh, in the states who, uh, you know, are so determined to get Trump defeated. And many of them, of course, are dubious in any case about uh, some of the radical socialist forces that are running on the democratic ticket. Um, that uh, he didn't make enough of a breakthrough. But the nature of the campaign uh, and and the popularity of it, uh, I don't think you can call that a failure. Yeah, right. I suppose we should say that he lost, but he didn't fail, right? That Because uh, in his losing, uh, I would contend that he helped spark something that is much bigger than him that will hopefully... Uh, be able to build upon in the in the years uh, in the years to come. Um, so in in this book, uh, you know, you wrestle with some of the uh, the the challenges that were facing a candidate like Sanders. And uh, rather than walk through every argument in the book, I wonder if we could just go through some very basic questions on a kind of socialism one hundred and two level. Uh, because I think a lot of our listeners, readers of Jacobin, many of whom are probably members of the Democratic Socialists of America, they're familiar with some of the most basic ideas of, of socialism, of Marxism. Uh, and you all in this book kind of uh, get to that 102 level. So uh, let's start with uh, the difference between social Democrats and, and socialists and why that matters. You know, I think we're used to it. Th- those of us who are familiar with this debate are used to uh, a debate over sort of like social Democrats don't 
you know, they don't, they want some uh, nice welfare state measures, but they don't want the real stuff, which is, uh, you know, socialism somehow. Uh, so what, what you, in the book, you guys go a little bit deeper than that. So can you talk about what that, what the difference is and why it matters? Well, I don't think the difference can be done categorically and descriptively. It can only be understood historically. Uh, and, and the book by Giddens begins by pointing out that, that a hundred years ago, uh, really one could say 120, 30 years ago, uh, you know, social democratic members and parties and leaders considered themselves socialists quite genuinely. Uh, you know, the mass working class parties for the most part, uh, that emerged between the 1870s and... Uh, the First World War, were explicitly socialist. Uh, what happened within them uh, was that partly by winning working class men the vote, and it was initially men, they nationalized the working class. That is, uh, workers who didn't feel a stake in the existing state were given a stake in that state by the parties who won them the vote. And that was a cross-class national identity that was created. And then secondly, you know, you the people who created those parties and acquired representative positions, leadership positions within them, they, you know, they realized this wasn't something you do as a hobby. And they started working full-time at this, uh, which meant you know, that they were no longer on the factory floor. They had control over the party press, the conference agenda, uh, the the bank account. Uh, and the tendency to want to reproduce yourself rather than going back to the factory floor. And the tendency on the part of the membership to adulate these leaders, as you also see with Sanders today, meant that they increasingly became somewhat unaccountable. And insofar as they were interacting with the bosses, insofar as they got elected to parliament, they realized that those people didn't eat babies for breakfast. They acquired some respect for them. Uh, and they began to operate in ways that was more oriented to securing class harmony within the existing arrangements while pushing reforms rather than uh, agitating and developing capacities among, among their members to actually be able to run the places they worked at and be able to run the state. So a process was inaugurated, where, and it was often encouraged by trade union leaders who were attached to these parties, who were, didn't, were afraid of endangering their organizations, should there be a crackdown on these parties. Uh, so there was a moderation that occurred over time. And by the 1950s, uh, the, all these parties moved towards uh, what they explicitly called social democracy rather than democratic socialism. And they dropped out of their party constitutions the commitment to the common ownership of the means of production. Their model became the American Democratic Party, ironically. The United States was, hadn't produced a socialist mass party. There been various attempts to do so, of course, but there had, hadn't. Uh, the Democratic Party, out of the New Deal, uh, rooted itself to some extent in the trade unions. Uh, in the 1950s, very powerfully, although in a non-socialist union leadership, um, and, and in that context, European social democratic parties emulated the Democratic Party, described themselves as catch-all parties. We appeal to all classes, right? That, that was the orientation they took. So increasingly, their, their ideology was that it wasn't necessary to get to socialism. They had, they had helped reform the system, real reforms, and out of that they concluded, as Anthony Crossland put it in the 50s, that in the 30s, if you weren't a Marxist, you were a mental dwarf. He used that word, I, I don't want to get in trouble with any disability activists. Uh, but by the 1950s, if you were a Marxist, you didn't understand 
that the state was no longer controlled by the capitalist class, that capital and labor had achieved a rough equality to one another, and that within the capitalist class, finance was no longer the most powerful faction. Well, you look back at that statement in the 1950s from our perspective today and you see how absurd that was. But that was the ideology of those parties. It was the ideology of the parties that the American left, the American socialists, uh, who admire Germany and Sweden and indeed the NDP in Canada so much, don't like to talk about very much. Um, you know, because those are the reforms they achieved are admirable and they haven't been entirely dismantled. They were powerful enough not to be. But in terms of the ideology, the ideology was increasingly indistinguishable from the Democratic Party. And all of this matters uh, because it, it is a rightward pull of these parties, right? Like they're, the, the, what, what they end up arguing for is pulled to the right. Um, but also there are ideas for like where, uh, what, what the motor of, of uh, social change is going to be seem to also disappear, right? It's not, they, the working class isn't centered anymore in the same way. It, exactly. They not only mistakenly thought that the reforms that they'd introduced would last forever, which was already clear by the 1960s as capital became more and more internationalized, uh, that those reforms either had to get go beyond them uh, or you were going to lose them. And that's what began to happen from the 60s on. Uh, people forget that Sweden was the you know, first European country to deregulate its financial system. And it had the first big financial crisis in the early 1990s. Um, so... That was part of what was going on, but was also part of going on exactly what you said was that they had, they were oriented to demobilizing the working class. They were, they saw strikes, especially wildcat strikes, unofficial strikes, strikes against a conservative union leadership as something to be not only avoided, but even suppressed. They were very distant for, by the 1960s from all of the new social movements beginning with, in most places, the movement uh, uh, to do away with nuclear weapons. Since they'd all bought into NATO, the Swedes less than most of them, but most of the rest of them completely. They were distant from the women's liberation movement, from the gay liberation movement, from the anti-Vietnam War mobilizations, in the same way that Hubert Humphrey was. They were Hubert Humphrey. Uh, and, and therefore, who was rooted in labor as well, after all, he came out of Minnesota, out of the Labor Farmers Party, had close links with the unions, but it was an orientation that was more like George Meany than it was a radical young worker on strike in Detroit. So I guess uh, what you're getting at here uh, is that, I mean, from our perspective at Jacobin, and I think from the perspective of, of many uh, young people who are excited by the Sanders campaign, when they hear about social democracy and social democratic measures, they think, well, we don't, we don't have very much of that here. And so getting a little bit of social democracy in the United States, I mean, that'd be nothing to sneeze at. That would transform their lives. And the point is not to say that those social democratic measures uh, that were achieved uh, over, over the, particularly the course of the 20th century, are useless. It's to say that the kind of social democratic uh, model uh, that uh, ends up in a kind of demobilizing of, of the working class and working class self-activity, uh, when, when you do that, then you lose the ability to, um, to even defend those social democratic goods, much less uh, expand into new arenas, those, that kind of social democratic goods, right? Yeah, that's right. And, I, you know, and I think one has to recognize as well that while these were very important and real reforms, uh, and were produced by a mobilized, class-conscious base behind those parties in the 1930s and the 1940s, similarly the New Deal to some extent. Like the New Deal, they were the types of reforms which didn't open up space for further reforms, which would take capital away from capital. In other words, they were constrained by the continuing dynamic nature of a capitalist system, that the reforms 
weren't oriented to getting beyond. They, they were oriented to living within that system. And that involved, very importantly, the way the state was structured. The nationalizations, the welfare state agencies were not oriented to democratic political development, uh, to encouraging people to think more broadly beyond those reforms. They were oriented to getting people a certain amount of consumption in a dynamic capitalist consumerized society. Uh, women who were most dependent on the welfare state in the United States, but also elsewhere uh, in you know Canada with our reforms that the CCF and NDP were crucial to getting installed, were afraid of the social worker knocking on the door. They didn't see those agencies as theirs to control and influence. They saw them as agencies of discipline. I don't have to tell you that in the States, but it was also true for a great many programs in the social democratic countries. Uh, and that's why, you know, Thatcherism was as popular in Europe as Reaganism in the United States amongst working people. So we've been talking mostly about the history of these kind of social democratic reforms and, and to some extent social democratic parties. You all say in the book that uh, avoiding the pitfalls of social democratization uh, is a central challenge for the 21st century, uh, socialists of the 21st century. So uh, w given that we're not in that same position to <laughs> even make those same mistakes that, you know, social democrats made in the 20th century, how does how does this uh, translate into being a burning question for uh, socialists today, you know, in the U.S. who got excited by uh, by Bernie Sanders or for, you know, young labor activists in the UK. What, what, what is, what is the, the, the pitfall of social democratization in the 21st century to avoid? Well, I think you are in the same position, if I may say so. Uh, I, I, I really think that, that uh, what you have uh, achieved uh, is of a, of a nature, of a kind, of a dimension that does put you in the same position. Um, and therefore, you need to be very, very conscious of what exactly you're doing. That is, you have put on the agenda, in of all places, the center of the empire, uh, the most radical reforms uh, that have go well beyond the New Deal, uh, that have been put on the agenda by, with a mass electoral support. Uh, in American history, you could argue. And uh, therefore, it's very, very important that what social democrats fail to do, you now do, now. And, and that doesn't mean you're not in a position in the sense that Bernie didn't get elected and he would introduce those things overnight which you know he wouldn't have anyway because he couldn't have unless there was sufficient support in Congress to get them through. But beyond that, it isn't just a matter of support in Congress. In order to carry those things through, to really make them happen, you would need two things. You'd need a strategy for implementation, which goes beyond would the legislation pass through Congress. It would have to be a strategy from implementation about how you would change the state apparatus, the state departments, the state agencies that would write the legislation for the most part and that would be charged with implementing it. Those agencies are structured in capitalist ways. That's not to say they're told by capitalists what to do. But if you walked in there, Micah, and said, look, I'm doing this in order to be able to orient this agency towards not being accountable to the need to accumulate capital, the need to get people into the labor market, et cetera, et cetera. They wouldn't think you're a terrible person, but they'd give you a broom and tell you to sweep the floor because they wouldn't know what to do with you, right? Uh, these, these organizations are structured in ways that are designed to reproduce the legitimacy of politicians in a capitalist society and are designed to secure a tax base for the state in a capitalist society. So the big mistake of Syriza, 
uh, was that it had enormous debates over policy. But virtually nobody, no matter how far left they were, talked about implementation. Yes, they were aware that we want to take honest people into the state rather than crooks. We'd like to take technocrats into the state, yes, and you do need expertise, but never talked through the implementation dimension. And the other side of this is, you know, while you're doing this, and in a sense, the main point of doing this, since Bernie getting elected wouldn't have been enough to do it anyway, is to engage in class formation through making these demands, building up a sense of class confidence, class identity, in a working class which has been so utterly balkanized and transformed and divided uh, through the massive changes that have taken place in recent decades. So let me stop you there. So you, you mentioned uh, Syriza, uh, which uh, is very, will be familiar to longtime leftists, but you know many of the people who got involved in the socialist movement through Sanders, I mean, some of them might have been in uh, high school or middle school when the, uh, the height of the Syriza fights in Greece were happening. So, uh, you know, that, that's a main uh, uh, section of the book in talking about uh, Syriza, the left party in, in Greece that uh, eventually uh, uh, was, was defeated, basically, uh, in its, uh, unwill uh, because of its unwillingness to kind of get over some of these structural limitations that we're talking about here. We don't need to go all the way into that uh, now, but, you know, you mentioned a couple things just now. Uh, one, you were getting at uh, the process of democratization of the state, which is something that you all write about uh, at length in the book, the need to transform state structures, which are set up in order to uh, not help average working people, but in order to facilitate, you know, accumulation for capitalists. Um, how do you do that, I guess, if you're, I mean, if, if Bernie Sanders is limited in, in how he can use the state because it's so set up in order to uh, to facilitate capital accumulation, uh, how do you go about that? Or what is the agenda for democratization, I suppose? Like, does that mean that if Bernie had made it into the White House that, you know, day one, uh, a kind of uh, reformation of the state or a, a democratization of the state should have been a key uh, reform that he was one of a key spate of reforms that he was pursuing precisely because there was nothing else that he could have gotten accomplished if he hadn't done that from the beginning. Well, not nothing. Uh, he he could have, you know, assuming he had support sufficient support in Congress, legislation could have gone through that would have looked. Uh, like uh, some of the legislation in the New Deal or some of the legislation that uh, Social Democrats introduced. Um, all of that, those, those policies uh, tended to get constrained by the practicality of uh, accountants <laughs> who would say, look, you can't give them this large a benefit because... They won't go back to work the next day. So it's partly a matter of, uh, okay, we're going to introduce a guaranteed annual income. Uh, we you know, aren't going to be able to introduce socialism overnight. Uh, but we do want the kind of guaranteed annual income that isn't going to tie people abjectly to the labor market. Uh, so it's a matter of working out those reforms and the administration of them that give scope to people not to be so dependent on getting a job uh, and that gives scope to the agencies not being so dependent on private capital accumulation. That is, part of what needs to be done uh, is that certain dynamics of the economy need to be subjected to the criteria of democratic accountability rather than private profit. So, in other words, people in the state agencies need to be connecting what they're doing to a broader orientation towards coordination with other agencies for democratic economic planning. You know, that ultimately is going to mean that the most important of the state departments, the Treasury, which has control fingers in every other department, will need to become an ally in trying to turn the financial system into a public utility. Uh, and will be coordinating, and that isn't going to be done overnight either, 
but will be coordinating the taking over of one of the major banks or two of them and developing the interest and capacity with that financial institution uh, to be working with other departments in the provision of uh, the kinds of public investments we need to have a Green New Deal. Uh, so, you know, it isn't, it's democratization in another sense, of course. It, it's also, for instance, in the, let's take the case of Greece, where Syriza was elected. The Minister of Education was an old Marxist philosopher. Uh, uh, used to write on Spinoza, quite famous guy, lovely, wonderful guy. And he wrote a very, very radical program for Syriza in 2012, a 400-page radical program, which ended with, uh, Syriza is, is not a slingshot whereby the people put us into the state and then we do it all. Syriza is a, a catalyst for democratic subversion of the existing system. This is very radical language. Well, as Minister of Education, uh, first of all, he was dependent on the existing civil servants even to know what corridor to walk through. Right? He certainly used to go to schools every week. He'd go to a different school and make his common speech. I will help you turn this school into a center of community life. I will encourage you to do it and I will help you do it. But he never was able to set that an agenda for the education ministry. You know, this was something the minister said. It didn't change their practice at all. And insofar as it didn't, the people in those schools that he spoke to didn't know how to do this. They needed aid from the ministry to do it. So that's an example of democratization. It's not a matter necessarily of everybody voting on every, uh, you know, debate over what policy will go through that department. Although some of that should be involved as well. You previously mentioned uh, the, the term class formation, which is a very uh, fundamental uh, socialist term. And I wonder if you can talk about, uh, at the most basic level, two of the most important institutions of class formation, uh, the union and uh, the party. So let's start with the with the union. I think a lot of young socialists know, you know, unions are good. They win good things for workers. They give people wage increases and better health benefits and all the rest of it. Um, the democratic socialist vision of why unions are important includes such bread and butter uh, gains, of course. But it, I, I, it's also about more than that. So can you can you talk about the the, the union as an institution of, of class formation in the democratic socialist uh, analysis? Well, look, I mean, part of uh, what's wrong with our discourse on the left is that we often speak as though uh, workers have this identity uh, inherent in what? Uh, their birthright, in their genes, whereby they know themselves as a class, they think of themselves as workers, etc. I mean, you know, people can think of themselves as men, women, workers, blacks, whites, gun enthusiasts, swimming enthusiasts, baseball enthusiasts, hockey enthusiasts, you know, etc., uh, they can identify in all kinds of ways, and there's no reason, and they should identify in all kinds of diverse ways. Uh, but if, given the nature of this economic social system we live in, uh, if the power of capitalists is going to be challenged, uh, the only way it can be challenged is, is those who produce the profits for them acquire some common identity, some common sense of interest, some common consciousness of themselves as workers. And, and that's what class formation is about. And what happened in the late 19th century, partly due to the way capitalism developed, was that it took working people who had been driven off the land where they were largely isolated producers with their families, and the capitalists gathered them together in large working places, right? Uh, that collectivized an identity already. Uh, some of them, some of those workers then realized 
that insofar as the boss was paying them all individually, you know, the guy working next to them may have been earning half as much as he was earning or twice as much. And they began to organize. And it was that process of organization that begins to create a sense of, yeah, I am a worker in a collective sense. And that's what unions do. Marx in the Communist Manifesto said, the first task of every communist party is to organize the proletariat into a class. So when you're forming a union, that is what is happening culturally and socially. And, you know, in most cases, in the case of the socialist parties, the socialist parties came first before the unions. It was the parties that spawned the unions in Germany rather than vice versa. In Britain, it was the union that spawned the party. Yeah, I think, don't you have a, you have a line somewhere that very pithily sums that up that it says something like, uh, class does not create party, party creates class, something like that? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And I don't need to be lecturing people in the DSA about this. I heard this expressed best when I met with Megan Day at a conference in Montreal last May. I had never heard it said better. She got up at this conference and said, look, I'm not in this with the illusion that I'm going to turn the Democratic Party into a socialist party. I'm running, I do see the value of running on the Democratic ticket because this puts us into contact in the East Bay with working people. We get into the media this way. They notice we're advancing things that meet their needs and interests. And it was because we ran a socialist black woman for senator, for state senator in California, in the East Bay, that we were then able to play a useful role in the Oakland teacher strike. Well, I mean, that said it all. That is precisely what one is talking about through this process. And the whole thing is only going to succeed insofar as it's not only a matter of articulating policy and running candidates, but that that is a process of developing uh, a new class capacity in the United States. So beyond that idea that I think most socialists are already aware of, that unions play this important role in winning things like pay gains and benefits gains for workers. I mean, what is the role, I think in the book you write specifically about the role of municipal unions or like public sector unions uh, in being part of that idea of how we transform the state. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the ambition should be uh, to try to turn unions into capacity builders for their members, encouraging them to learn how to change the labor processes in public sector agencies, uh, to change the state apparatus so that it represents workers and the people that workers serve in the state apparatus, rather than uh, as, as almost all the agencies are, uh, being structured to reproduce capitalist relations of production. And, and we don't know how to do that. And uh, the great failure of those socialist parties who were based on the unions of the 20th century uh, was that together they didn't work at doing that. Uh, now, that's a very, very large task to expect of them. And right now, most union leaders and shop stewards, uh, committee men, uh, organizers actually discourage their members, say, in different branches of the same department from talking to one another directly about such questions, because they're likely to get a a note on their file saying they didn't try to communicate through their superiors over these questions. And that'll mean more work for the unions in terms of how to process a grievance 
when workers are disciplined for doing this. The exact opposite should be the case, of course. Now, that involves changing the unions in, in very fundamental ways. We often think of the public sector unions as more progressive than the private sector ones, and in some ways they are, but really they're far from what we need in terms of le linking up with the people who are dependent on public services and together with them changing how those public services are operated. One of the reasons Thatcherism and Reaganism was so popular was that even single mothers on welfare never saw their income maintenance workers as serving them. They saw them as their disciplinarians. You know, someone who would knock on the door of the apartment and come look around and see if there was an extra toothbrush on the sink. Um, and, you know, uh, with the presumption, therefore, that there was a man around who ought to be supporting them. So I think this is essential in terms of having a vision of what we need to do to change unions to, to make them into agencies of transformation themselves. What you're getting at is, obviously, we're very far from having that be the dominant approach, even within public sector unions in the United States, for example. But obviously, teachers unions in particular have been on the forefront of this lately. Unions like the Chicago Teachers Union or uh, the Los Angeles Teachers Union. Other, others, you know, at least among education unions, people seem to understand that they need to be fighting for uh, the entire working class, uh, you know, not just uh, narrowly defending their own pay and benefits, but be seen as as a as a, a body that is fighting for uh, the entire. I mean, in Chicago, for example, you know, the Chicago Teachers Union, in addition to talking about broad educational justice issues like fighting for the interests of their students, they're also talking about police violence in Chicago against African American communities in particular, affordable housing issues. They're using their uh, their public sector bargaining uh, in, to, to fight over issues like uh, affordable housing. So there, it seems to be that there's some movement on on that front. Yes, I, I, I absolutely agree. And it's been very, very inspiring. Uh, very, very inspiring. Uh, and, and that ought to be an example uh, for other public sector unions. Uh, I used to advocate in the 90s to, to nurses unions who were very militant in Canada. Uh, and often were going on strike uh, which, illegally because it wasn't legal for them to go on strike and winning that in the next bout, round of bargaining, they ought to make a top priority getting uh, an hour of paid time once a week for everyone on the ward, regardless of whether they're cleaners uh, or they're uh, nurses, uh, to be sitting down and discussing the labor process on that ward. And then the second round of bargaining, they should get another hour of paid time to do that with the patients on the ward. That's the kind of steps that need to be taken. And I entirely agree that especially the Chicago teachers and the Los Angeles teachers uh, have done that. And I think it reflects what can come of uh, people who have confidence in their abilities, uh, who have the status of being highly skilled workers, uh, turning their minds to this. The trick will be to build that confidence amongst people who don't have that status and who are designated as low-skilled but are, in fact, essential. And much of what they do is, in fact, involves a great deal of skill but isn't uh, registered as such in our educational system. And what you're talking about here is not just about unions being better able to win the kind of fights that they're already engaging in. But it sounds like what you're talking about is unions as a vehicle uh, to become the, the kind of force that can actually transform our entire society, right? Like prepare themselves for socialism. You could say prepare themselves for a future society or move themselves towards a future society uh, where they're not just using their unions to like react to what the boss is doing to them, but that they are, they are, they are not object. They are subject, right? They are taking uh, uh, active measures to remake how their work and how their society is organized. 
If they were to do that, in fact, they would be fulfilling what Marx and Engels, perhaps at their most romantic moments, described unions at, which was schools for socialism. Uh, and, and that needs to be the ambition at the very least. Now, that has to be said, this can only take place insofar as more space is created in uh, our political system for unionization. Uh, and, you know, although these ambitions are very great, they can't go forward without winning the kinds of reforms that are promised by every Democratic presidential candidate, uh, or for that matter, gubernatorial one, uh, promising to create the basis again for increased union membership, uh, greater space for collective bargaining victories, etc., which they haven't come through on. But it's very, very important that we realize that Republican administrations, above all the current one, are above all oriented to restricting that space. And it's really, really important, therefore, that even with small steps that simply involve getting back progressive labor legislation is crucial to being able to go on to do this other stuff. We just can't be content, as the unions became for far too long, with having achieved those highly restrictive, in fact, New Deal labor legislation reforms. Uh, to shift gears here, you talked in your recent YouTube video for Jacobin about the thought of Ralph Miliband uh, near the end about the uh, socialist relationship to liberalism. And I think there are lots of young socialists or newly minted socialists who look at what they associate with, you know, American liberalism, like prominent American liberal Democrats, right? They look at Hillary Clinton, they look at Joe Biden, they see the obvious ways in which those kinds of figures fall far short of uh, uh, trying to transform the world in the way that it needs to be transformed. And they say, that's well, that's why I'm a socialist, that's why I'm joining DSA, uh, because I understand that that falls short. Uh, but for a lot of them, it's only a, a quick jump to then say, well, I'm, I, I'm just, I am beyond liberalism in general as a, as a body of political thought. And, uh, th and for them, it's like not the real stuff, you know, not the real freedom, you know, quote unquote, bourgeois freedoms. Um, what, what is the proper socialist, um, uh, orientation towards those basic liberal rights? How should socialists think of themselves uh, in, in relation to liberalism as a body of thought and to basic liberal rights? Well, I, I think basically one wants to be aware that the limitation of liberalism is precisely that it can't fulfill its promise for the majority of human beings unless liberals become socialists. Um, and, and that, you know, in other words, it is the protection of property and protection of property rights that restricts liberalism's promise, the best of liberalism's promise, if you like, the John Stuart Mill promise, that by virtue of political freedoms, individuals will be able to develop themselves to their highest level. And what Marx was saying, essentially, to those people is that, yes, that's our common goal, but by virtue of your attachment to property rights, you cannot realize that goal. Uh, that said, uh, and I, therefore it is, I think, very, very important to make a distinction between liberal and socialist goals. What we're essentially saying is that the goal of socialism is to incorporate and transcend liberalism, to incorporate the best of it and transcending its fundamentally deeply inscribed link with capitalist societies. The distinction you're making between rejecting a Biden or the Democratic Party uh, and being a socialist, uh, you know, if we only had uh, that kind of guarantee that without being in a common project 
with liberals to protect political space, to protect the rule of law, if we aren't in a common project with them to do that, then what gets lost are the capacities to build trade unions, are the capacities to create new socialist parties. You know, is the space for socialist cadre to engage in class formation. The first thing that authoritarian regimes do in a capitalist society is they close down trade unions. That's what Hitler did first. Before he banned the working class parties, he closed down the trade unions. Uh, and what I fear very greatly from a re-election of a Trump administration uh, is two things, uh, as we've seen in recent weeks with the firing of inspectors general. The ending of accountability in the American state under the rule of law. And secondly, the closure of space, of political space. For the left, and I would define the broad left, both as including the socialist cadre of the DSA, but also of union organizers. And, and we have to be able to make that distinction. Now, it is true that a, a good deal of the 20th century left, very much fearful of repeating the Stalinist class against class mentality of the early 1930s, which said the social democrats are the same as the fascists, the social fascist line, right? A great much of the left, including communists, responded to that with a popular front response to the authoritarian regimes of the 1930s. And they, therefore, every time there was a challenge from the right, they would align with themselves with anyone who wasn't quite that right and would gave up, and it was often the communists who led this, gave up the task of education and mobilization uh, in order to ensure that the right would not win. Uh, we have to find, and which is much of what I was just saying, but we have to find a way to retain that understanding of the danger of, of losing liberal freedoms, while at the same time not giving up on our responsibilities for political education, above all socialist political education, and class formation. Uh, so if the Bidens of this world say, uh, I want your support, but if you're going to talk in socialist terms, if you're going to go public and say, we need finally to get the union reforms that Democrats like me have promised for four generations, for, for, for four decades, right? Then I don't want your support. Well, then it becomes a different story, but he's not going to say that. We just have to be sure that we don't swallow that stuff in order not to embarrass him. On the contrary, we need to support him. And we need to say be, we're supporting him because of these reasons. That, if for that re In that way, we can, coming up to the October election, Americans can both support Biden and educate people on why it's necessary to have Biden in a more fundamental way than just being negative about Trump. It sounds like what you're advocating is something that you also write in, in the book in a broader sense, which is about uh, avoiding the pitfalls, both of the uh, Leninism of the 20th century, as well as the social democratization of the, of the 20th century, that the, the democratic socialist charge is to sort of take the best from both of those traditions and, and jettison the, the worst of both of them. And what that means, especially in the context of this conversation, uh, specifically about liberalism, is not to just throw out all of liberalism wholesale. Uh, it is to recognize sort of uh, what what is essential about it and, and what uh, is incapable of even uh, carrying out its own task as even in the terms that it sets for itself. Right. Uh, uh, and, and that socialists should not somehow uh, believe that uh, to be a real serious socialist is to toss out all 
of uh, liberalism, just like as a democratic socialist, the task is not to just throw out all of Leninism wholesale. No, I th- that's absolutely right. And not least Lenin's understanding of uh, the importance of class struggle. Uh, indeed, the, the class struggle being at the core of uh, uh, our, our contemporary societies. Um, yeah, I, I, I think one has to say that that given the polarization that is developing between left and right in the face of the irrationality of global capitalism, uh, given the way that authoritarian forces are developing, I think the chance is great for, if I may use the term, a hegemonic socialist strategy, which uh, presents the choice again as one between socialism and barbarism. And therefore, the case for socialism is presented as an egalitarian one, as one that meets social needs through collective responsibility, but one that at the same time protects freedom of speech, the rule of law, freedom of association, etc. That that too, if that's going to be preserved, has to be preserved under the leadership of socialists or that's going to be lost to authoritarian capitalists. I think that has to be the fundamental appeal, the fundamental ideological appeal we make uh, in the current conjuncture. And I think we will win people over that way. Final question for you. Uh, Most of our listeners are Americans. You have written at length uh, in in this book and elsewhere uh, about the uh, specific role that America plays in the global capitalist system in the 21st century. Uh, Can you just briefly describe what that role is? And then given that, what does that mean for socialists in the United States in particular? How should we see our task as building the socialist movement here? You know, what, what is there a specific importance uh, that uh, American socialists should feel and the need for them to build up a robust socialist movement in this country? Well, Micah, when uh, people on the American left, as they have so often through my adult life, have looked with starry eyes to Canada, I've often said to them that we only look good as long as you on the left in the States remain on your knees. Uh, and, and I think that's essentially the case. Um, uh, you know, insofar as as people have looked with starry eyes at us for having a social democratic party or greater union density, etc., it's because the American left in the balance of the class struggle in the United States has been often so marginalized. Uh, That said, uh, what has happened uh, with the Sanders insurrection the growth of the DSA, the type of union activity we've been discussing in Chicago and L.A., etc., proves to me that the American left is capable of blowing past the kind of reformist stuff that they look to in Canada and be so impressed by. Maybe you haven't been constrained by social democracy to the extent that we have. Uh, holding on to this little foothold electorally uh, in this third party that we have in Canada, or you know even the major parties in Europe. And if that happens, uh, if you continue to build on what has been set down in the last five years, um, I really think the what you'll be doing for the world uh, needs to be come into the equation. Uh, You can't change the world without changing the balance of class forces within each nation state. That is where politics are located. That is where bourgeois society is located. It's located within the framework of nation states, no matter how global it gets. The American state, as Sam Gindin and I tried to show in the making of global capitalism, through becoming an informal empire in the second half of the 20th century, was the key state involved in the making of global capitalism. 
uh, if the American left is going to be able to shift the balance of class forces in the United States, uh, that will have a knock-on effect on class struggles everywhere else in the world. And it'll create space for class struggles everywhere else in the world. We will then have to learn to cooperate with one another, beginning with cooperation around joint co capital controls. So that capital that tries to escape one country where there's a powerful left is not allowed to take that capital into another country to escape those capital controls. Those are the type of immediate arrangements we'll need. But we'll also need to inspire one another in all kinds of ways. We need to be, I think, sober about this. One of the things that disturbed me most about people going down during the social forums to Brazil was they'd come back and say, oh, everything's wonderful there under the Workers' Party government. And they sounded somewhat like Sidney and Beatrice Webb, Webb, the famous Fabians who went to the Soviet Union in 1935 and said, I've seen the future and it works. No, it's our responsibility to look soberly at what's being done at each country, including the United States, and come back and say, look, these are the trouble. This is the trouble they're having. These are their limitations. This is what they're running into. We need to learn from their mistakes. We must not only be inspired by one another, in other words, and we'll definitely, uh, you know, rely very heavily on what you do in the States. We also need to take it upon ourselves to be critical of what you do in the States. Because only by being critical of what you don't accomplish will we be able to accomplish more in our own country.